All right, well, good morning, everybody. You're, you're almost awake. That's great. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I think any time we have a chance to talk about uh, rural health in a national context, but then also bring in the notion of, of health equity is a, is a great opportunity for us because um, sometimes I think the, we tend to be you know, sector-oriented in how we fund our federal programs. Sometimes we get sector-oriented in terms of how we talk about the issues, and I think it's nice to bring them together. So <clears throat> what I'd like to talk about today is just a little bit to provide you a little bit of a context for how we view uh, rural health in a broader uh, national discussion. Uh, Mike's going to provide much more of a deeper dive into the disparities and the data and the research, but I hope to at least explain a little bit about uh, policy making and how it affects rural communities and a little bit about um, how HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services, um, sort of approaches rural health um, and that hopefully that will inform our discussion today. <clears throat> but this isn't obvious, um, you know, I think sometimes the, the, the trap we fall into in policy making is that we think that we can take urban based solutions and just sort of um, downsize them to rural and that it'll work without any problem. I'm reminded of the New Yorker cover where you have New York and Los Angeles and Chicago and the rest of the country is just a vast wasteland. and. Um, while that's a little bit of an overstatement for what I'm talking about, the fact is that I think that making national policy can be a challenge in the sense that it's very hard to take into account uh, Utah, Alabama in the same way that you would take into account New York or Boston. And in some ways, if you can get national policy to work for 85% of the country, some people would say that's a, that's a worthwhile goal, that's, that's you, you've done what the best you can. And that may be true, but it isn't necessarily equitable. And so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about some of the factors that I think drive those misperceptions um, in the hopes that it will inform our larger discussion. So, you know, there are a lot of reasons that I think rural is different than urban. And this is just my sort of short list. And, and you may have others that you would add to it, and uh, maybe we can get into some of that in the discussion. But there are a couple I would draw your attention to. And the, and the, the first one would be um, just that rural is not uh, the same everywhere. Um, it seems like a rather obvious point, and yet, uh, while there are some commonalities, there are also many differences. What you deal with in the Deep South is very different than what you're going to be dealing with in Northern Maine. Similarly, it would be very different than what you see along the U.S.-Mexico border or the Delta uh, or even uh, in Appalachia. And so, you know, you have to think about the fact that every region is a little bit different. And uh, sometimes we do that better than other times in terms of national policy making. Um, the mix of clinicians is different. Uh, you just don't have as many specialists, and I'll talk a little bit more of that in, in terms of the workforce in a minute. Weather as a, as a factor. And when you're traveling distance for care uh, out in the West, uh, weather can be a really limiting factor in a way that it isn't in other parts of the country. Um, and then the other one I guess I would draw attention to would be the payer mix. Um, you know, the, 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 everything is driven by how we pay for health care services, unfortunately. And, and the reality is that in, in rural communities, Medicare and Medicaid and CHIP make up a dominant part of the payer mix. And that flips in urban areas where third party insurance tends to be the dominant payer. And so anytime we make a change in what we do in Medicare and what we do in Medicaid has a disproportionate effect on rural providers and it affects their ability to then provide care to the citizens in their communities. And so all of these are things I think we'll touch on today in the course of our discussions. Um, one of the most thorny questions we get at the Federal Office of Rural Policy is how do you define rural? And luckily there are only 300 different answers. <laughs> I'm only going to talk about a couple of them. Uh, really, when you talk about defining rural, you have two building blocks, counties and census tracts. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget uses the county definition. Uh, census, the B census Bureau uses a census tract definition. Uh, because these are not uniform across the country, they're all very different sizes, especially as you move west, they get larger and larger, counties and census tracts. Um, you can never come up with a perfect definition of rural. For the purposes of our discussion today, why don't we settle on the OMB definition of counties? That leaves about 17% of the population living in rural, spread across about 80% of the country's land mass. In terms of the, the physician workforce and the other healthcare workforce, you know, this is not a surprise to anybody in the room, even if you've never even done much in rural health fewer providers. Uh, it's always been a challenge, probably always will be a challenge. And uh, we also see in rural areas that nurse practitioners and PAs make up a, a bigger part of the primary care workforce in rural communities compared to urban where you have a little bit more specialization. Obviously there's not enough dentists and oral, and oral health providers in rural communities. This has long been a challenge. The more striking one for me is the absence of mental health providers in rural communities. 
This is data from our University of Washington, our Rural Health Research Center there, and I direct you down to the bottom right-hand corner of the slide. Seventeen percent of non-metro counties have no mental health practitioner whatsoever. No psychologist, no psychiatrist, no licensed clinical social worker, no psychiatric nurse practitioner. Uh, this is a real, real challenge, especially considering some of the issues we're facing with today in terms of behavioral health. Now, if you think about the physical infrastructure, the provider infrastructure across the country, um, uh, this probably oversimplifies it a bit, but so much of the hospital and clinic infrastructure that we see in rural communities gets special protection under the law in recognition, I think, of the fact that uh, it's tough to provide care in low-volume rural communities from an economic standpoint. And so, in terms of hospitals, there are 2,000 rural hospitals in this country, okay, 5,000 total hospitals. 1,300 of the 2,000 rural hospitals are what are known as critical access hospitals, meaning that they have 25 beds or fewer, and that they're, most of them are at least 35 miles from another hospital. They get special protection under the law from Medicare, um, and also a little bit of a break in some of their regulatory uh, burden. So, these hospitals since 1999 have really been a, a stabilizing force in the sense that the payment designation has, has addressed some of their challenges. That's changing in the last couple of years, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But you can see certainly in the middle part of the country, uh, the critical access hospitals really are, uh, are the dominant part of what you'll see if you see a small rural hospital in the country. And even of the remaining 700 or so uh, rural hospitals, the vast majority of them get special protection either as sole community hospitals or Medicare dependent. The point I'm making is that without these special protections, we'd have a real problem in terms of ensuring access to inpatient and emergency care in rural communities. Now the provider group you're probably all much more familiar with are the community health centers. And we've had dramatic expansion in community health centers across this country in the last 15 years, and particularly in the areas of oral health and mental health. In many cases, if it were not for those providers and those community health centers, we would not have access to mental health or behavioral health in many of these communities. We have about 10,000 uh, community health center service sites across the country. About 40% of those are either located in or serve rural communities. The third provider type are the rural health clinics. These are Medicare certified rural health clinics. There's about 4,000 of them in the country. Uh, about just over 50% of them are provider-based, meaning that they're owned by small rural hospitals. Um, and the reason I've used all these slides is just because you can see it's a different mix. Sometimes they're in the same areas, but sometimes they're in different areas. And certainly the rural health clinics, as you move west, you're going to see them in some areas where you wouldn't have a critical access hospital, where you wouldn't have necessarily a community health center. Now, from 1999 to about 2010, the critical access hospital designation had really stabilized uh, the rural hospitals' economic challenges. Um, but we've seen since 2010 about 79 rural hospitals close their doors or suspend operations. There's no single factor behind this. A lot of issues at work. Uh, declining population, um, declining inpatient utilization. Um, in some cases, the, the Medicaid expansion has created some challenges where that has not happened for these hospitals. The payer mix issue I mentioned earlier, it's just tough to keep a full service hospital open in some communities where you just don't have enough of that population base. In other cases, um, we've got market factors at work that, that just made it impossible for those facilities to continue. Now, we've only had two closures in 2017, so maybe we're seeing a change in that trend. Hopefully that's the case. But if you look at the University of North Carolina's projections for hospitals in financial distress, you see that, that we still have quite a number of facilities that face some real challenges. And so I don't think we're out of the woods by any stretch of the means. And um, Sharita Thomas is here from the North Carolina Rural Health Research Center, and she's done a lot of the work on this. So um, she can probably do a deeper dive this afternoon if you have further questions. Uh, a couple other factors of the rural health infrastructure. Um, EMS, largely volunteer-based. Um, really financially challenged in the sense they have to cover vast geographic areas with a sort of a low uh, patient volume, so you have really high fixed costs, so providing EMS services can be a real challenge. Uh, in terms of public health, uh, rural public health departments look a lot different than their urban counterparts. I stole this slide from Mike Mead, so he knows a lot more about it than I do and may go do a deeper dive later, but the key factor here is I think that they derive less of their revenue from their local community and therefore they tend to bill for services more, and that creates its own challenges in terms of the accreditation process for local health departments. Um, so all of this sort of manifests itself in some interesting ways in the sense that um, when we think about national policy, it's easy to fall into some pitfalls. 
and I mentioned finance. Uh, the fact is, the way we pay for healthcare services, we tend to pay based on a system of averages. And that works great if you're in an urban area and you can spread all those cases out. Um, but if you have low patient volume and you're being paid a fixed cost, sometimes if you have a higher cost case, that ruins it for you for that year. And so finance is a real challenge. Uh, another example is sometimes we make assumptions about like models that we think will work in rural communities. Uh, back around 2000, Medicare started paying for diabetes self-education management. Seems like a good thing, right? If we can help diabetics manage their care, we'll get better outcomes. Well, you had to have a certified diabetes educator. You had to have accreditation from the American Diabetes Association. You had to have a physician. You had to have an advanced practice nurse. You had to have a diabetes educator. Um, that wasn't the case in a lot of rural communities. So while we could have built for these services, they couldn't meet the requirements. Now, that's gotten better over the years, but I offer it more as a metaphor uh, for some of the challenges when we think about this is the team that we think is the right way to deliver services. Similarly, um, sometimes just the, the tyranny of numbers gets in the way in rural communities in the sense that um, and our department does this sometimes. We'll put out a grant opportunity and we set a population threshold. And you can only apply if you have so many folks in that area. And that feeds into the other trap, which is evaluation. Sometimes we'll say, oh, well, you could come in for this, but you have to have this population base because we want to be sure that it's statistically relevant. Um, and now I'm all for academic rigor, um, but not if it gets in the way of service delivery at the detriment of a really high need population. And so those are all challenges. Block grants, I've been hearing a lot about that in the last couple of years. As, a, as we move more towards block grant funding, um, there are advantages in the sense that it may be a more efficient way to deliver the services or states are better connected uh, to their local communities and may be able to better make those decisions. And yet, we also know that in block grants, you're trying to move that metric. You're trying to move the dial. And it's easier to do that if you focus those dollars in large metro areas. So states have to face this difficult challenge of do we send the dollars to where we have the highest need or do we miss our performance metrics because we focused more on, um, on low population areas. And so that's a real dynamic tension that they have to deal with. Um, you know, I think technology is often thought of as a solution for rural health care. And I think that it, it can be. Um, uh, telehealth is a good example. My office funds a fair bit of telehealth, and yet um, I think the challenge for us in that is it's not a solution in and of itself. It's a tool, and yet it often gets sold as more than that. And in some cases, like the adjunct health system, that's separate and apart from the way we deliver health care normally. And I think until we figure out how to better integrate telehealth into the everyday delivery of care, it's going to still be that way. Similarly, electronic health records are sold as a way to sort of make sure the patient's information follows the patient. And we know rural folks get their care in urban areas, and we know they get their care in rural areas. And in a perfect world, that information would go right with them, and everything would be great, and the doctors in the urban areas would talk to the doctors in the rural areas. And yet we know with information blocking and health information exchange, that's not quite happening yet. So I offered this up mostly because I think you have to realize that why technology can be a help we have to think about how we're going to do it, and there are a lot of policy barriers to making it work in the way that we theoretically uh, think it would. And again, none of this will work if we don't address the broadband gaps in this country. And there are significant areas where broadband is either unavailable or unaffordable. So how does HHS think about this? Well, part of that is the reason my office exists. We were created about 30 years ago to be a voice for rural within HHS. And so um, uh, what we try to do um, is make sure that with our colleagues and in the various agencies that make up the department, uh, that we think about how our policies and our programs affect rural communities. Now, the way we do that is we review all the Medicare regulations, the Medicaid regulations, the marketplace regulations, all with an eye towards how does this affect rural communities. Another key part of that is we fund seven rural health research centers around the country. And their work informs our policy role, but we hope it's broader than that. We hope our, our, uh, the research work we fund also informs policymakers uh, more broadly, both at the federal and the state level. And we also operate a national clearinghouse for rural health information, the Rural Health Information Hub at the University of North Dakota. Now, what we're trying to do here, and one of the issues I hope comes up today, is the whole notion about an evidence base. Uh, so much of what we invest and think about in an evidence base tends to be in an urban context. And so that doesn't mean you can plug and place off the shelf into rural communities. We are, through some of the work that Mike Meatschop is doing at the National Opinion Research Center, is trying to develop a rural evidence base so that folks can replicate what we know works in rural communities. So the other thing that in my office that I think uh, offers a path forward is uh, rural targeted funding. We're the only part of HHS where our authorities say 
This is funding for rural communities that only rural communities can apply for. And what I think it's shown is that when rural competes against rural, it's a level playing field. It's a real challenge, I think, for a uh, small health department or a small hospital or a community organization to go up against a big metro area in terms of writing a grant. Uh, think about a tribal community and uh, the challenges they have in applying for funding. So um, we have about $60 million a year that we put out in community-based funding. And it's, 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 I think it works because it allows rural to only be competing against folks that are similar to them. Um, and so that may also be a consideration to take into account is how can we better target funding so that it makes more of a level playing field for rural communities. And, and we do the same thing in our telehealth funding and we also work a lot with small rural hospitals, but we fund that money through the states. And again, it's rural targeted. Um, for your considerations today, I would draw your attention to a brief that the National Advisory Committee on Rural Health and Human Services recently did during a site visit in New Mexico and Dolores was, spoke to this group and, and uh, Octavio is on that committee and we really looked at the social determinants of health through a rural context. Are there some social determinants that are more predictive in rural communities than other communities? Um, and that brief is up there on the web, but one of the key findings was uh, some of the issues I've already raised, which is the way that we allocate funding sometimes makes it challenging for rural communities to bring the resources to bear that allow them to address the health disparities in their communities. But the brief gets into that and makes several recommendations to the department. So if you think more broadly about how the federal government supports rural health, it really falls into a number of categories. Certainly from a workforce standpoint, we support a lot of training and placement um, you know, through our training programs or through the National Service Corps of getting folks into rural areas. Through the U.S. Department of Agriculture, we do a lot of access to capital. So a lot of the times when we rebuild or renovate a hospital or a community health center, it's done through USDA funding or the new market tax credits that are offered through Treasury. Uh, broadband deployment supported by the Federal Communications Commission and the USDA. Uh, and then there's the whole policy process, you know, how Medicare allocates its dollars, how Medicaid, uh, what the framework is for the marketplaces um, in both the state-run marketplaces and then the federally facilitated marketplaces. But there's a lot of ways that either through allocation or direct funding, the federal government has an impact on healthcare delivery in rural communities, and it's quite varied. Now across HHS, just about every part of our department has programs that are relevant to rural communities. And um, one of the challenges I think we have is, do rural communities understand which programs are most relevant to them? And then can they competitively get the funding that's allocated through it? And I think we've made some real strides in this area. Um, I think the federal in, uh, interagency health equity team has been um, a good mechanism in which to bring rural considerations through the National Action Partnership. We know that a lot of uh, some of the discussions, particularly at the local level, have been about rural health equity issues. So I think this has offered an effective mechanism uh, to bring attention to these issues. And I've got a staff person on my, in my office that we've assigned to be on this and to monitor and to be there to provide that rural perspective. Similarly, within HRSA, um, luckily I don't have to preach to the choir too much. Our folks in, uh, across our programs understand rural, whether it's the community health center program, the home visiting program, uh, what we do on our Bureau of Health Professions. I think maybe because we're located in HRSA and we complain all the time, they pay attention to us. And uh, so I think they're doing an effective job in that regard. But I would also talk about the work uh, Kara James is doing at CMS with the CMS Rural Council. It's really brought a, a fine point of attention uh, to the way they do their business. And it's created an awareness, I think, both in the regulatory process, uh, but also if, even as far as the Innovation Center. Um, the work that CMS is doing, I think, has really become much more targeted in understanding the challenges of rural communities. Um, and I think about some of the, uh, the demonstrations that are coming out, like the global payment demonstration in Pennsylvania, um, as being a really innovative example of ways to rethink healthcare delivery and how we finance it. And then one of the projects we're working on with CARA was um, uh, part of legislation that created the new uh, physician fee schedule, um, and that was the MACRA legislation. We were required to do a national campaign on chronic disease management in both rural and underserved areas. And, and it's been a great partnership because there's a lot of new codes under Medicare that we think that can help people think about taking care of seniors with multiple chronic diseases in more of a population health focus, but getting the awareness out there about it, making sure people are aware of it is really the challenge I think we have. The other part that I think CMS has really done well on recently is 
rather than being reactive after the problem hits, is thinking on the front of it. So if you think about the macro legislation and the quality payment program, there was $20 million in technical assistance for small and rural practices on the front end, getting them ready for it. That didn't happen 20 years ago. My office wouldn't, wouldn't exist if it had happened 30 years ago. Um, I think the history of rural health has sort of been one of unintended consequences. And I think as a department, we're getting a little bit smarter about ways to think about these things on the front end. And these are just a couple of examples of that. And then the other one is uh, what's going on right now that really noteworthy is what's happening with the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, they have, are in the middle of a 16-part series through their mortality and morbidity weekly reports looking at rural issues. And it's heightened attention, I think, across their centers and their offices um, about uh, what we know about rural health and rural health disparities. And the fact is, when CDC focuses on a public health issue, the nation focuses on that public health issue. And so I think it's really significant, uh, the work that they're doing. And I think it's just the beginning. We're hoping to create a permanent working group with them to really make sure that rural remains front and center for them moving forward. So that is about the fastest 20 minutes you can get in federal rural health. So I'd like to turn it over to Mike at this point. Thank you.